All right, everyone, welcome back in. It's another episode of Believe in Vikings for today, Monday, September 16th. And it's it's a Monday. It's a day after the game. So it's a BMAC Monday here on Believe in Vikings. Excited to bring Bryant McKinney in to talk about the Vikings victory over the San Francisco 49ers, break down some of the key moments and then look ahead to the Houston Texans game, because that's who the Vikings have next at U.S. Bank Stadium on Sunday. But first, Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. Think you know your stuff? Get in on our $200,000 mega contest and pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game's over, head on over to their online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of their over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Bet Online. The game starts here. And our conversation with Bryant McKinney starts right here as well. Hey, BMAC, how you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good. Just got off the road. <laughs> yeah, you uh, you were in Baltimore uh, this weekend, I understand, taking in the Ravens game for um, always fun to go back and see some old friends and teammates. But um, you guys were there to honor the lives of two members of the Ravens family who recently passed away, I understand. Correct. Yes, the O-line coach who passed away recently and then Jacoby Jones who yeah. passed in July. Yeah, so um, – you know, um, obviously, for a somber reason, you get together with everyone, but it's always good to see members of of your family of a former team. So, uh, unfortunately, the Ravens lose that game to the Raiders in what Las Vegas would term an upset. But the same thing happened at U.S. Bank Stadium, BMAC. The Vikings were on the right end of an upset on Sunday. They were six-point underdogs going mm-hmm. into the game against the Niners, and they – I'm not going to – you know, they certainly didn't blow San Francisco. It was 23-17, but I was there – and you never had that sense of like, oh boy, here we go. This is Vikes are in trouble here. Like they were, the Vikes were in control the whole time, which was kind of a surprising outcome, you know? Yeah, that's good. When I seen um, McCaffrey was out, I was like, okay, they have a, a good chance that one of their lead guys is gone. So I hope they really can take advantage of this. And I feel like they did a great job uh, going out there and managing the game and executing. Yeah, they did. So I'm going to walk us through some key moments um, in this game and you sort of, can give your analysis of it and sort of tell us what was happening maybe from a player or a team perspective, but just generally before we get into any of those, it's um, it was sort of a really positive, I think moment for the Vikings BMAC because Kevin O'Connell has been all about physicality uh, mm-hmm. this year for his team. And you were there at camp. He, he changed his training camp from the first two in Minnesota to be more physical. They had more padded practices and more intense practices because O'Connell wanted to ramp up that intensity and physicality. And so they go to New York and they beat up on the Giants a little bit, but that was the Giants. So everyone's like, let's see if they can do it against San Francisco. And then they did it against San Francisco. So if you're in that locker room right now, I mean, you have to be riding so high on confidence, right? Oh, absolutely. Especially coming off a big win um, at home, your first home game against a, a, a pretty good team. So um, absolutely, you feel confident. And I feel like that just helps too, like with momentum, because – that was a big game that they won. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're really one of the stories in the NFL right now. I mean, there's a few things percolating out there that are getting attention. I've seen the Vikings. one with the referee running downfield. I keep up with uh, Justin Jefferson. So How about that guy? One, one of the stories I've seen. Oh. <laughs> Great. I mean, how the athleticism is unbelievable. He had to hit the brakes to let everyone go by, and then he caught right. back up, got ahead of the play. <laughs> Uh, it's crazy. And th- you know what, though? That was actually the first situation I was going to bring up to you. Not, not not, for that reason, although that was a little bit of a subplot to that play. That was a 97-yard touchdown, BMAC. So, right. So I'm going to tell you what's funny is Tom yeah. West asked me if <laughs> I was on the field when Bernard Berrien did a 99-yard one. I'm like, yup. He said, well, close, because today was 97, so it was definitely yeah. close to Bernard Berrien's. <laughs> so, and you know what the similarities are? I'm glad you bring that one up, because that Bernard Berrien one for, for us in 09, 08, 09, 08 maybe, 08, I think it was 08. It was Gus Farad who threw it, right? So um, that was right after our defense had a goal line stand, like like inside the five-yard line, held them on the one. And then that's when Farah to Berrien for 99 happened. And that's ha- what happened on this one, BMAC. The, the Vikings defense had a goal line stand. It was first and goal at the four-yard line. Vikings defense holds them. And then moments later, you hit a big play like that. How about the, what's happening there, like the momentum? 
I mean, not the defense is like, oh, geez, we gotta well, go back out there. But... Alignment, like we're we're loving it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're loving it. All we gotta do is trot down the field and get ready for field goal <laughs> yeah. after that big play. Ugh. Um, but it just makes the guys feel good how quick, like you can just turn things around and, and have a big play, big strike down the field. And I, I'm pretty sure it makes the quarterback feel great too to be able to execute. Oh yeah, I mean, and you know, Darnold threw an absolute dot on that one, perfectly thrown, fifty-four yards in the air to Jefferson, who comes down with it, and then breaks to the left sideline, stops, cuts back to the right to make sure he scored. Um, so obviously, you love to see that from the receiver who's thinking score the whole way, and he and he gets it done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I'm just thinking about like momentum in the building you know you just had a great goal line stand now you've got a 97 yard touchdown the crowd is going nuts and the defense gets to go back out on the field right after that you know mm -hmm. so you talk about just flipping the field and flipping the momentum around and really taking it to the other team and then that got them to go up 10-0 you know um yeah. and so a really big moment in that game for the vikings obviously early on i thought late in the first half was another key moment so here's the situation bmac vikings up 10-7 Mm -hmm. it's uh first and 10 from their own 30 yard line with a minute 53 to go. So two minute drill time, mm -hmm. they go eight plays, 49 yards. They kick a field goal to go up 13, seven and San Francisco doesn't get the ball time expired in the first half. Um, they had a 16 yard reception to Justin Jefferson on third and 13 to extend that drive. And then Darnold had an 18 yard scramble on third and 10 to get into field goal range. So pretty cool when you can, drive like that put up a field goal and not let the Niners get the ball yeah um this is good management that's why I said at the beginning I feel like they managed the game pretty well too um and yes. the opportunities for uh, the 49ers so I think they did a good job so like in a situation like that is is the coach getting with the, with you guys and being like all right guys here's the part we don't want to give them the ball back and if we can get a field goal that's a bonus or are you getting that direction from the quarterback in the huddle is the in a key moment like that where it's not just business as usual but it's situational um, football I want to I want to say you really really get in that direction based off of the play calling um okay. if they feel like you can run the ball they'll do that to kind of run the clock out so based off of what the OC decides to uh, call as far as the plays it kind of gives us an idea of what it is they're trying to do yeah, because I heard a, a, a comment from O'Connell post-game press conference where he said, you know, yeah, we, we really didn't want San Francisco to get a chance to score and get the ball back. Yeah, so, so that's probably communication between the co the head coach and the OC, and yeah. then it, it just relates to us through the plays. So we can tell from the plays uh, what it is that's trying to be done. So if it's a run play, we like we know that they want us to run the ball and that keeps running the clock out, so we got to make sure we get first downs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's, you know, that's the game within the game, right? I mean, those are yes. really key moments in a game because, you know, you don't want to give a team momentum. You know, you've got this team down 10 nothing or 10-3, right? It's like mm -hmm. we are, do not want them to get the ball back and get some points going in the locker room at halftime and get them in, you know, give them some positive momentum. So a really nice job there by the Vikings of accomplishing both of their priorities, not letting the Niners get the ball back and then also putting up some points of your own. Another key moment, uh, Josh Metellus interception midway through the third quarter. The very next play was a Jalen Naylor touchdown from Sam Darnold uh, to make it 20-7 to Vikings. And so we always hear about that, BMAC, about like right after a turnover, that's a great time to take a shot, right? Mm -hmm. And have did you feel that way too when you were playing or is that get over – is that overhyped? No, it's, it's actually true because then it really like can really – kill the momentum of the other team and make them feel like, oh, gosh, now we're even down even more, like, you know, and yeah. then you're on the road, too. So when you're on a road like that, you got to already deal with the crowd noise, but now you're playing from behind, so everything is, like, more passing and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's a good time to go go for it. Yeah, and so another example, I mean, the Vikings also picked their spots going for a big play with that 97-yard touchdown, right? Because, you know, you're, you're on your own three-yard line. Quarterback's mm -hmm. in the end zone when he takes the snap. Um, you know, so some teams just want to take their time and methodically dig themselves out. Other times you want to take a big shot to try and get out of there. So two examples there where the Vikings with game management situations had to make the right call and they did so. And then the last thing. Um, so Vikings had a lead uh, uh, early in the fourth quarter, 10, 16 to go in the game. And the Vikings drive BMAC 14 plays, 62 yards. So they're I'm up six. Up the clock. 
Yeah, uh, there was, uh, they kicked it at the 332 mark. So a little over seven minutes off the clock. That's good. Yeah. How about that? And, and talk a little bit about like when you're doing that, just in this physical game where you're trying to impose your physicality and your will on the other team, you're able to do that late in the game. You got to just like feel that momentum and not feel, you don't feel them maybe submit because the Niners are a tough team and they're mm. competitive, but to just you're, you're at home and you construct a seven minute drive in the fourth quarter to go up by two scores. And then when you're, when you when you feel like you're having success running the ball too, you, it makes you feel good. If you feel like you're really imposing your will on that defense and it almost feels like you can kind of control and dictate what's going on. So it's like, we can run the ball at will and then we can throw in a pass to keep people honest as well. So, Yep. Yeah, it makes you feel good. And, uh, and I like being able to be on offense and run that much time off the clock because then they keep the defense fresh. And then um, it just limits the amount of time that their offense can be on the field. Yeah. So in, in those long drives, do you not feel the the tiredness because you're succeeding? Because like it, like in a two-minute drill when you're down or if you're two down. Two-minute like, drill is different. Because okay. two-minute drill, everything is like bam, 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 bam. But when it's just like a long drive, no, because some plays, it's, it's just different. The tempo is different from two minutes to like, you know, the regular plays. Um, and for me, you'll see when the next good group of guys come in and they start, you know, you wear it on the first group because, you know, D-line rotates. Yeah. Um, and just mentally, I just tell myself, okay, now it's time to wear this group down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then hopefully yeah. we can get a couple run plays. I like to, I used to always like to do like a couple run plays to just get the collision and, and really like just like start wearing their body down, and then it'll start to me slowing down their pass rush. So, um, be, them being able to run, I feel like it just was very effective for them. So the the play calling went, went pretty well in their favor. Yeah, the play calling was was really good and it was balanced, and and that's good because Sam Darnold, who's got a great arm and is a talented thrower, um, it doesn't matter if you have Sam Darnold or or, or Peyton Manning, mm -hmm. you know, you want balance. I mean, right. and, and and it's not because your quarterback can't handle that many throws. It's just you have a better chance of succeeding in the passing game if the defense knows the threat of the run is legit, you know? Right. Um, um, and that's why I say it goes back to keeping them honest. So you Yeah. Yep. And I've also noticed that, you know, Aaron Jones is obviously, I mean, he's a great back. Um, you know, he's played in the league for eight years and was really productive for the Green Bay Packers. And he comes to Minnesota, and he's definitely the feature back. But I, I did, I just looked at snap counts, and it's sixty-five percent for Aaron Jones, thirty-five percent for Ty Chandler. So that that truly is, uh, a, you know, that that truly is a a split in in snaps and carries for the running backs that should keep Jones fresh later in the year, don't you think? Sixty-five, thirty-five. That's a, a pretty good split. No, actually, it is. Um, so definitely keep him fresh. Um. I will say, like, having a, a physical training camp, I think at a certain point he should know as far as in practice, while they're in practice now, to start pulling back a little bit. Because I do remember times with us, with Coach Sykes having a very physical training camp and coming out and kind of being on fire now because – but just start to pull back a little early. Because I feel like we went, like, six or seven weeks of, like – and then it can get, like, people start feeling worn out, you know, yeah. worn down a little bit. So just know, like, just start to pull back a little bit in some of the practices of – it being super physical because you just want be have like duration. Yeah. So like late in those Tice years, who, who were let's see, it was like Michael Bennett was one of the backs. Um, Mo Ontario, Williams. Mo Williams. Oh yeah. Ontario he was Smith. Yeah. Yeah. So the Vikings had a little bit of that going after Robert Smith was gone. He was, but he, even he and Leroy Horde would go back and forth. Um, it's just so rare now. Unlike when we had Adrian, Chester was a good, was more than a good chance. Yeah, well, Chester, we, had a, we, yeah. We, we had a nice rotation of running backs, I feel like, all the time. Yeah, and it's the best when whatever back is in, it doesn't tell the defense what's coming. Right. Right? Because sometimes that can happen where it's like, oh, oh that back's in? Well, they're definitely passing here because that back's in. So if you can right. get it where it's like you can't tell, that helps the offense too. It does. So it'll be interesting to see to see how that snap share um, changes uh, throughout the course of the season. But right now, they're definitely keeping Aaron Jones fresh. One thing that happened late in the game, BMAC, was Justin Jefferson was uh, he didn't finish the game. He it looks like he's okay, but he has a thigh contusion. Have you ever had a thigh contusion? 
No, it's just, is that a, like a bruised it's thigh? It's a bruise. Yeah, it's okay. a bruised thigh, basically. Okay, so it'll probably take a couple of days. I'm, I mean, I'm surprised that it probably affected him during the game, but maybe because of all the running. Yeah, it sounds like he might have taken a helmet or a shoulder pad to the thigh, and then he, he didn't come back in the game, which, you know, obviously is not great, but they got good news in that they don't think it's a serious injury and they don't think he's going to miss any time. But it is cool to note that that last drive that we talked about, uh, over seven minute drive that got him a field goal to go up by two scores that happened without Justin Jefferson, without okay. Jordan Addison, without TJ Hawkinson. So here you've got Sam Darnold doing all of this with both hands tied behind his back, basically. So two things to me for that, it tells me the offensive line is doing a good job. And it tells me that the play caller is able to adjust quickly. Both things will bode well for the Vikings down the yeah. road. I definitely say a combination of both of those things. Um, the play, I, just, like, I really feel like the play caller was really good. Um, the play caller is definitely doing things to make adjustments for his quarterback. And then I feel like the quarterback is doing a great job, too. And probably doing a great job at practice, you know, passing the ball around, being familiar with some of the targets that he's hitting. Yeah. So here's an interesting um, component. Let's spin this forward, uh, talk about the next game for the Vikings. They play the Houston Texans on Sunday at noon at U.S. Bank Stadium. So interesting component here is that you have two former Texans – on the Vikings, Jonathan Grenard, who's an outside oh, linebacker, and then uh, inside linebacker Blake Cashman. So former Texans playing for you, and then the Vikings have Daniil Hunter and Stephon Diggs oh. playing for Houston against yeah. Minnesota. So now Diggs has been gone for a minute because he went to Buffalo and then mm -hmm. Houston. So he And Diggs was never coached by O'Connell, but Daniil Hunter was. Daniil Hunter was here last year. So mm -hmm. you've got his familiarity with Minnesota. Now he's in Houston and then vice versa with those two Houston defenders. So is there anything to be said there? Or does that angle get overhyped? Um, those guys just share kind of what they know about the pl players, like far as like personnel wise, may try to tell you some tips to look for. Like, you know, when they're out there on the field, some things they, the O-line may communicate. He's not sure things have changed. But basically the personnel wise, he'll be able to tell you yeah. This type of player people are. That's interesting because, like, the coaches are in control of the like the the game flow and the style. Like, we're, this is going to be a big pass game, big run game, whatever. The coaches can change some stuff, but players are players. Like, they've got things that they're good at and things that they have to compensate for. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really change. So that's interesting. It's more of a a personnel, like it a one-on-one -on -one personnel. personnel thing. Yeah, in interesting. So I'm pretty sure whoever has to go against whatever he's able to share his knowledge of that type of player or they like to do this or this, you know, basically how to, he feel like that he could, yeah. somebody could defeat the person. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, so the Vikings will be at home against Houston um, yes. this, this week. And then they're on the road at green Bay and then they play the jets um, in London after that. And then a bye week. So what, what are you thinking about the squad so far? What do you think? lying ahead you know what's what are they going through what's on their mind they, they've got sort of like like you take the season in court you go week to week really but you kind of take the season in quarters but mm -hmm. i put that jets game as a fifth game in the first quarter and then you got that bye week afterwards so obviously you want to win every game but the vikings looking at four and one or three and two you got to feel really good about that don't you think yeah i, I do um especially because some of the games that some people might have counted out, like this is a game where people say, like, well, I don't know if we'll win this one, but they won it. You know what I mean? So yeah. keep stacking up a couple of these and win the ones you're, you're supposed to win and then go out there and steal a couple of these or, you know, just outplay the people like that you've been doing and just surprising people and you'll yep. find yourself in a great position. Yeah. So the Vikings are going to continuously run into this, like this measuring stick thing where it's like, great, you beat the Giants, but can you do it against the Niners? Right. right. And then it's like, okay, you did it to the Niners, but can you keep, can you do it twice in a row? Um, when you played, whether it's in Minnesota or Baltimore, what were those measuring stick games? Was it playing the Packers every year as a Viking? Was it playing the Steelers every year as a Raven? Playing the Packers was for sure. I want them because they, we're normally at the top, so it was kind of like we kind of battled with them for top position in uh, the NFC. Um, and then when I got to the Ravens, the Steelers was definitely – it was always a yeah. back and forth between the Ravens and the Steelers during that era. Um, so, yeah, seeing how you did against those teams and watching those teams play other teams as well to see how good they really are. Yeah. And then you want to see how you measure that against them. And you get to play them two times a year. So, yeah. you not if you couldn't get both of them, you at least want to get one and split it. Yep, for sure. Uh, last thing, and then we'll get out of here for today. Uh, the, the Houston Texans head coach is D'Amico Ryans. 
former player in the league, obviously. Yeah, um, is Andre Johnson on the staff? He's he's over there doing something as well. Ooh, is he really? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I hadn't he's, read. Well, he may be like in the front office or somewhere, but he's he's over there doing something. Oh, good for him. Um, we talked at um when you were in Minnesota, BMAC. We talked about you know the the trend of younger coaches and former players as coaches. Kevin O'Connell being one of them. Mm-hmm. D'Amico Ryan's I would put into that category as well. Um, any thoughts on the job he's done with Houston? Did you ever run into D'Amico? I don't even know if you guys would have played at the same time or not, but you know, I think we did play at the same time. Um, okay, can't remember how often though, but yeah, I believe we have name is definitely familiar. Um, yeah. I think the younger coaches, especially guys who've played before, I feel like have a better idea of how players feel. Um, yeah. cause they've been through it and that's just through experience and some things you just can't teach is if you have the experience, you kind of know. Um, so I like seeing those those guys there, um, but I think he's been doing a pretty good job and trying to you know be able to relate to to you know this new era of players too. So yeah, I think he's, it's a work in progress in that building. Yeah, um, you know, and it's like you you balance that <clears throat> a younger coach with less experience, but he played recently. The advantage there is knows how to communicate with players, understands the new world and the locker room dynamics, but might not have that experience and that history. As with anything, you have to balance it as an organization and say, is this the right coach for us at this time? Right? Because there might be some teams where you're like, we need a veteran guy to come in here, someone who's been through it a few times. I feel like it depends on how fast you're trying to build. If this is somebody you feel like, oh, we want to build with him, then it's like we're going to just – take him and grow with him. We feel like he has longevity being a coach here, so we'll just take him now and we'll just get the experience along the way. Or if this is like, we need to win right now, so we need a veteran coach or somebody with a lot of experience. And just based on, it just depends on how they feel, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was researching Andre Johnson. It looks like in 2019, he was named as a special advisor to the coaching staff. So he, oh, might, okay. still, he might still be doing that. Um, did, and did, did he go into the hall? Yeah, so he's the uh, first Houston Texas player to go in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he went in. Was that this just this, this summer? When, yeah, that's pretty summer. cool. Uh, did you go to the Hall this year? I didn't. I had a charity event um, the okay. same day they had the event. Have you ever been there for an event? I haven't, but I need to go because keep, a couple of my guys, especially the Hurricanes, too, have been going in because two went in this year, Andre Johnson and Devin Hester. Yeah. I'm so glad Hester went in. I mean, you, he totally yeah. deserves to go in. Yeah, he definitely did. You could, I mean, you can skip past guys who were specialists, you know, kickers, punters, returners. Those guys, though, I mean, they, yeah, 24, 20, 18 snaps a game. It's not, you know, 60 mm-hmm. like you played, but they could definitely impact the game. So it was cool to see Hester get honored. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to go to the hall uh, a few times, BMAC, when I was working for the team, like when Chris Carter went in, Johnny Randall went in, Chris Dolman went in. And it is just an unbelievable experience. So, you definitely got to find a way to get there because you'll love it. You're you're a football history guy. You have respect for the game. You would mm-hmm. still absolutely love it. All right. Well, um, yeah, Vikings Texans on Sunday. Um, we're gonna have the host of uh, Believe in Texans uh, on later in the week, B Max. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, that to have okay. him on. We'll, we'll get his perspective on on the Houston Texans. But then you and I will do this all over again next Monday after uh, the Vikings and Texans play. It's kind of cool. It's one of the only matchups between two two and oh teams next week so oh, you know, okay so it should be exciting it's kind of a big time matchup you know back it at, is. and at us bank stadium i'm excited to watch make um i almost said mckinney derisa and o'neill go against daniel hunter i mean daniel hunter like 78 sacks as a minnesota viking right oh, okay. so coming back into the building always cool to see right. your, your former great players come back and um that'll be sort of a fun matchup to watch but all right man well thanks for joining as always have a good rest of the week all right oh no problem All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of Believe in Vikings. We thank you all for listening and for watching. Make sure you download, like, subscribe, and follow Believe in Vikings wherever you do that with all your other favorite football podcasts. We're also on YouTube, so if you don't check us out there, make sure you go to YouTube and watch Believe in Vikings. That's it for a BMAC Monday. I'm your host, Mike Wobshaw, signing off for now. Until next time, everybody, keep believing.